Welcome to Filmmaker U Live. Each week we sit down with the pros to discuss their techniques and ideas in the process of creating films and your favorite television shows. I'm your host, Gordon Brickell, and this week we have Kevin Ross with us. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Uh, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I guess I, my first question for you is about uh, what you've been up to during COVID. Have you uh, been working? What have you been doing? Uh, well, uh, I was on a show called Them Covenant that was just about finished in production when COVID hit. And um, so uh, luckily my assistant, Danny Williams, was he was ahead of the game and he had backed up all our media to drives about a week out thinking, this is all going south. We're all going to go home. We better be prepared. And when it happened, we were allowed to all grab our Avids on that Friday to put all the equipment in our, in our cars and drive it home. And then for the next eight weeks, we stayed at home and edited from home. So we worked from home, got a little experience with that, did it on the fly. But um, until the beginning of June is when I ran out of material to cut. So <laughs> that was all done. So wait, when you set up at home, was it, did you have an office that you could work out of or were you at the kitchen table? <laughs> um, I, I have an, it's this room I'm in right now. It's like an yeah. extra bedroom that I've, we converted for office space, but uh, um, it was a little, you know, crazy. We didn't have a, a special setup per se here. I didn't have an Avid at home. So just brought the equipment in. And then while a few weeks in, I ordered this awesome uh, electronic table. So a rising table, cause I work standing up. Um, I've been mm -hmm. doing it for 10 years because of back surgeries, but now it's like everybody has a standing desk and it's awesome. I can't uh, recommend it enough, but then, you know, a few weeks after it showed up and I set it up, it was, uh, the show was over. <laughs> so now I just have the standing desk. Well, it's a, you can, you can start taking it to all your gigs. Yeah. Or I can keep working <laughs> from home with it. So I'm all good. So. so can you tell us, um, I guess how you got started in, as a film editor? Uh, how I got started as an actual film editor per se, uh, I got my break in television. Uh, I was a feature assistant for a long time and I worked on some pretty big features. And the reason I was able to move up as an assistant editor was I started back in the days of film. So everything was film based and I worked on Kim's and Moviola's. Um, but then this nonlinear system started called Lightworks. And Avid was in television, Lightworks was features, and Fox Studios bought like six Lightworks and wanted to switch it over. And I happened to be lucky enough to be one of the film assistants who learned how to use that system. And so when Fox needed to have assistants to teach editors how to do nonlinear, I got one of the first jobs and that was Mrs. Doubtfire. And so that got me in the union and I was an assistant editor on Doubtfire, Speed, Nine Months, Miracle on 34th Street, all these Fox movies. And, um, <clears throat> and, and it was pretty steady work. And I was always on location. I was in San Francisco, Calgary, um, Chicago, Napa Valley. Uh, had a great time, a single guy on location, but uh, I never got the chance to be bumped up to editor. And so on, uh, on the side, when I wasn't working as an assistant, I was editing low budget independent movies. And I had a friend, we did a couple of like two, $3 million movies together. And, um, and I edited those. So then I thought, I'm just gonna work my way through the indie world. However, one of my editors who I had learned the, the Lightworks with, he was like, hey, Kevin, I'm cutting this pilot and uh, I really need you to assist me and help me out. And so I was hesitant he goes, look, if you do it, I'll tell them you're an editor and you're slumming it with me right now. But if the show goes, please make you an editor. And so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll take that deal. And luckily enough, that pilot was picked up and I got the job as an editor on it. And that was 2000 and I've been editing the television ever since. So I do want to step back a sec because you mentioned speed. Uh -huh. Did you guys know what you had while you were cutting it? Because I feel like that was a film where if someone pitched it to me and they're like, it's a runaway bus. <laughs> I would have been like... I don't well, know, but it did so well. And it was such a great film. Look, I, I will be the first to admit, I never thought it was going to be a success because I was like, nobody in their right mind is going to believe that bus jumps that gap. I mean, that's <laughs> just unbelievable. I couldn't suspend my disbelief enough. Yeah. But uh, well, to, uh, to tell you the truth, what happened on that show, and I'm not telling any secrets that aren't already out there, is that when it was first being shot, Fox was really down on it. They were very unhappy. You know, they were seeing dailies, but they were seeing eight cameras 
of action and didn't know how it was going to go together. And they kind of weren't very confident in the film. And then when they saw the editor's cut, my editor, John Wright, did an amazing job with that. He, I mean, it was all him. The whole, the whole film is his editing prowess basically made that film. And so um, when they saw the editor's cut, they were like, oh my God, we got a good movie. And then they went and spent $2 million on new VFX to add like the, the bus on a wide shot, seeing the gap. Uh, it's a really wide shot. They didn't have that shot. You know, um, One of the exec producers added it because they realized, hey, now we've got something that's worth worth wow. really doing a wide release on. So uh, it worked now, out well. Was there, it's every time I've talked to an editor, there's always like that one editor that um, I don't sort of, that I was sort of like a mentor to them and sort of showed them the ropes. Was there a particular editor that you can think of that was that for you? Well, I would say that the mentor I had the most experience with and getting to learn how to work the craft would be Alan Baumgarten who's gone on to become Oscar nominated, you know, he's, and I think he's won an Emmy. I, he's mm -hmm. doing great. And um, he's <clears throat> right now he just finished the new Aaron Sorkin film, which is coming out. Yeah. Um, and that has a lot of buzz on it, but um, you know, I worked for him when we did not, when we did these little low budget kickboxer two was the first movie I ever worked with him on. And that was like, I did that one summer in between uh, uh, my grad, you know, first year grad classes and second year and um and we went from there and did lawnmower man and he bumped me up and i got to be the second editor on that associate editor and i got to cut like 30 minutes of the movie and and i had my own kim with eight plates and that was a great experience but alan is the same editor who uh, who asked me to come back and do his pilot mm. so i would say some of many of the opportunities i've received are because of him the uh, lightworks show we got to do the, the first TV movie on Lightworks because there were no other people that knew how to do it. So we got trained on it and, um, and it just worked out really well. So uh, yeah, I owe a lot to Alan. I mean, Raja Gosnell is an editor I've worked for that, um, you know, I, I learned a lot of the technique of how he did stuff for comedy, which was great. But Alan, I would say was the most influential. Is there a particular technique you learned that uh has sort of stayed with you? I, no, I don't think it's a technique. It's just how to conduct yourself in the cutting room and um, how to look at things and review all your dailies before you start. And, you know, he's, he just set it up the right way for me to understand. And you have to know that back in, um, in film days, what would happen is we would sync all the dailies as assistants. The editor may look at the dailies that had come in from the night before. But then after they wrapped the show, we would all have to go to a screening room and the director and the editor would sit on the front row <clears> watching <throat> the dailies. And as the assistant, I would sit between them with a pad of paper and take notes when the director would say, okay, I like the start of this take. You know, and, and I saw how he interacted with the director and that relationship. And, um, and that was very informative. So I wanna to jump to the X-Files. Sure. Coming, that, so this is a series that had already been popular in the 90s and then you're coming on. So how did you tackle sort of, I guess, helping work with it to bring it up to the sort of more modern style or more modern storytelling well, uh, from the original? I, I don't think I ever <laughs> reflected on the originals because each episode, especially the, I only had two of those and it was in the very last season. Mm -hmm. and, um, and both were by uh, director James Wong who was one of the original X-Files writers. And so uh, you attacked each one that there may have been a small through line with the uh, Scully and uh, Mulder plot, but it was its standalone episode unto itself. And so it was just trying to make that as exciting as possible. And we weren't restrained by, you know, oh, this is the style of the X-Files in the past. We just mm -hmm. cut it however we thought was necessary. Uh, maybe even with less flash cutting things that happened in the nineties like, yeah. uh, or, or early two thousands. I, there's one show I cut that I was like, Oh, I'm really proud of that show. It was like my second or third show. And then I go back and watch it. And it was back when interstitial little flash cuts were at the were popular when you went in and out of acts. Yeah. Now I look at them and go, Oh, I can't, that's very dated. And you know, you, <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't hold up now type of thing. So so it's not going on your reel is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, not, not anymore. No, it's it's off. So 
was there a particular show that you you felt like and still looking at it now you're like that's a really you're I'm proud of that work um well you know I have a lot of those shows that I'm really proud of the work that everyone did on it and then no one watched it and it was always disappointing that you're like no one got to see this great story that we created and mm-hmm. that's the most disappointing part but you know it's out there and maybe someone will discover it like that, uh, like well, the riches can- <laughs> the, the riches the rich i love the riches the riches yeah. uh, mini driver eddie izzard and eddie izzard really hadn't acted that much before being a comedian but really really learned how to be an actor on that show and, that's crazy because he comes across like he's been acting for years yeah well no he had done some things uh, later on i cut the biography of eddie izzard for uh, mm-hmm. like a, a two-hour biography about him which was very enlightening and then i suggest everybody watch it because you really get to understand him as a person yeah um it's called believe if you ever find yeah. anybody but uh, uh that show was great halt and catch fire is one of my favorite shows i've ever cut because the acting and the storytelling and the directing and just the whole design was amazing and that was one of those shows where i said the actors are so great i don't have to worry about trying to create a performance i get to like just fine tune it and I get to play with how they deliver their lines. And, you know, there's other voices by the showrunners on what, if they want to go that way or not. But mm-hmm. there was so much material to play with. That's the best. Sometimes I've cut like a network <coughs> show. I've cut a network show where um, one of the leads may not be up to snuff or there might be problems. And it's more about, hey, we better try to fix this and have mm-hmm. some sort of show that makes sense when it airs versus... I get to do whatever I want with their performance. Excuse me. <clears throat> you made me cough. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's okay for the Eddie Izzard bio that you did? Had mm-hmm. he already run the marathon journey? No, um, that was at the very end of the. That was uh, added at the end. He was doing and, that twenty-four marathons or thirty marathons in thirty days or something yeah, like that. Yeah, which is a me. It's a, if anyone's watching. Uh, that is likes Eddie Izzard definitely check that out I think it's ITV or BBC did it it's yeah 24 marathons or 30 marathons in 30 days Uh, I don't remember what the total is but and and Eddie is a super great guy and yeah for a couple of years afterwards we we would all get together and we went to his house to try to discuss how can we make a movie to wrap up that series because the series ended on a cliffhanger because the Writers Guild strike happened and um, you know that was that was too bad. The Writers yeah. Guild kind of killed that show. Yeah. Now, jumping back to the X Files, um, one of the things that I remember from the original series versus uh, and it was part of the new series is the tone. So, how do you, as an editor, um, you know, embrace the media that you're given to help enhance the tone or make make the show meet its tonal desires? Well. Um, as far as X Files goes, I would say that we we were ex- we were given the tone just by how the dailies were presented. It, you kind of are informed by what you what you receive, and if you also have a library of music and sound effects, so you know what that kind of is. It a dreadful type of you know is it going to be campy light or is it going to be serious and and and. and it, that's how it helps you inform the tone. Also, because I came on, I replaced someone who had to leave for another show. They'd already had two or three episodes ready. So I got to, uh, to review what was already finished. So I knew what I was jumping into mm-hmm. and mine didn't have to stand out so much. Um, but, uh, you know, it's the way I, I view editing is you just take whatever material you're given on whatever show it is and try to service that story and make it the best you can. So, um, you know, that's why I've never uh, struggled jumping from comedy to sci-fi or horror to drama. You know, I've, I've done genre, I've done it all because I don't feel like you can ever get pigeonholed into one thing like, oh, I'm just a comedy editor or I'm only a, a horror editor. Because as long as you know how to service that material and you know what the intention is by reading the script and talking to the producers and the director, you're going to come up with something, you know, that is, is right. If you know what you're doing, you know, you can't just go in there and and be carefree and do whatever you want. You have to try to do the best you can for that story. 
So what do you do to make sure you're not pigeonholed? Because I've heard, I've talked to so many editors who are like, that was one of the frustrating things is, you know, they started in comedy, but they wanted to be a drama editor. And then all of a sudden they were stuck in comedy for years. Uh, well, you know, I've been very lucky in that some of the producers that I first started off with when I finally made that jump into editing happened to like be hot at the time. And they didn't want to stick with comedy. You know, like my first thing was an hour horror show called mm -hmm. Freaky Links. And that was by the Blair Witch guys who were hands off, but that's how they sold it on Fox from the producers of, you know, from the writers of Blair Witch. And that was kind of a Scooby-Doo uh, horror internet type of, of show. But then the same director who did the pilot, uh, Todd Holland, his next thing was called Wonderfalls and he teamed up with Brian Fuller. And that was um, a one hour, it was shot in Toronto. It was set at Niagara Falls and, um, and it was a great show. And it was one of those shows that, you know, somebody at Fox didn't like, and so they wouldn't promote it. And it was too bad because it's hilarious and it has one season, it's available on DVD, it's great. But so I moved from a horror show to a comedy. And then, um, and then the next one of those producers, Tim Minear, went and did a procedural and he took me along for the procedural. So then all of a sudden my first three credits are three different genres. And so that helped me keep going. Um, you know, um, geez, I've done police procedurals, but guerrilla filmmaking like of Southland, which is, uh, was a really cool mm. police show. Um, I, ha I got lucky and got to do the last season of that. So that, it, that expanded my, you know, my, um, my bag of tricks as you were, because now I knew uh, I had stuff on my reel that shows that I could cut these running gun type of styles of following the camera around, um, you know, because you don't want to scare people that say, you did six seasons of Californication. How are you going to be right for the riches? You know, they're totally different. But then yeah. I, I happened that my luck was that I was in the right place at the right time. And I did a good job so the, edit, the producers and directors trusted me to take me on to the next one, even though it wasn't the same. You know, I think that helped a lot. Now, we have a question uh, that's come up on, on our Facebook here from Eric, and he wants to know, for Stranger Things, in the first two seasons, there's a lot of uh, jumping back and forth between uh, reality and time and past or current reality, uh, mm -hmm. the upside down and the dream world. Uh, what kind of techniques uh, were used specifically, if any, to help bridge those types of scenes? Well, what we tried to concentrate on that was we used a lot of sound design, basically, mm -hmm. to pop into uh, into the upside down. Um, mm -hmm. And and also, even in our Avid, we timed it so it was less saturated and, and less colorful than the real world, so that we would visually see it, but also we had this... Uh, the sound that we created that like a hard snappy edit with a boom or something got us mm -hmm. into the, the upside down. And then um, we had sound design by Craig Hennigan who had already handed it over. And then we just added that in layer upon layer to give each world a different feel. So a lot of sound, a lot of sound work went into that. Um, I mean, it's funny when I started as an assistant on film, you only had one track of audio. You had a mag track and it was dialogue. And when you wanted to, sh to screen your editors or direct, not the editor's cut, the director's cut, you added a couple of extra sound design to it. So you'd have a second track and you were like, I've got two tracks of sound. I could put music here, or maybe I can put a gunshot on this. And then you would go some to a sound house and you'd put the two tracks up and dub them down to one so you could screen it easily. Um, that was a big deal to get a two to one, it was called. Um, but then I learned as I've gone on, the expectation of what your cut is supposed to sound like has gotten more professional all the time. And 10, 15 years ago, if you had a little bit of ambience in there and some music tracks, they loved it. Now that wouldn't pass muster. You need to have everything filled out. <clears throat> Granted, you do have more time, I think, as an editor and assistant where, uh, at least in the assistant world, the way I take it from, when I started in nonlinear, you had to put the three quarter of the beta deck in and you had to watch every take, get digitized into the Avid or Lightworks. And you had to make sure that it was running on the A-frame so it didn't stutter, 
So there was a lot of like intensive work that took up a lot of your time. Now, and then you had to do the logging and the marking and getting it all organized for your editor. So I was used to that. Now it's, here's a drive, here's, the, here's all the takes, load them in your bin and sort them. Now that still takes time, but I feel like there is a little more time that, um, you know, if I had been asked to do sound design on the Avid 15, 20 years ago, I would be staying probably till 10 o'clock at night trying to do it versus uh, I think it's more, um, it's, it, it's a, ch a chance the assistants have to actually do that material uh, to, to help you fill it out. And th the question is, is that something that's part of the job description? And it probably isn't, but it's become an expectation. I don't know how we get around that. Yeah. When we're talking our union, do we, do we make sure that only a, a sound editors do the sound work? You know, because, but then you can say, oh, it's only temp. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, that's the problem. And I was on the board of our union for nine different, you know, nine years. And yeah. that's one of those things we always struggled with is how do you keep it so that people stay employed with their job description when other people are taking that away from them? But, yeah. um, but I, I think now you need to have all that sound and you yeah. need to have a full cut. Well, I always, I always say like, whenever I hear my temp, sound i'm like yeah it sounds okay but then you hear like the good sound design and it's really good yeah um and that's usually like it's kind of <clears throat> a frustrating thing because you know it's going to get all thrown out but you know it's going to be so much better well and, uh okay. i was just going to say what's what's frustrating is i i think oh our sound sounds great and then you hear other fr i hear friends go oh yeah I, I did my whole sound mix in five one in my room i'm like wait a minute what you know and <laughs> I'm just like, I'm lucky to fill my tracks, but you're doing it all with, you know, and I'm always amazed when I hear stuff like that. Well, it's, how do you tackle sound? Is, like I've heard different approaches, like some sound designers, or sorry, some editors want to do it all themselves. Some give it to their assistants. Some have the assistants just source the material and get a bin ready for them in the Avid. Is there a particular uh, approach? I, I've, I've done all the, all the above actually. <laughs> and it just depends. And a lot of it has to do with the trust you, you build with your assistant. Like, I don't want to put too much on an assistant if I'm, you know, if I'm just starting to work with them. But yeah. if, I, if I have a relationship with them and I've done multiple shows, I, I trust them because they know what I'm looking for because we've discussed it before. And, uh, and I also believe it's important that assistants get to cut scenes. And so... I'm, I try my best to always make sure that an assistant gets to cut a couple of scenes in every episode I do so that they build their reel up. I think that's very important. Uh, and it's also a good way of having a learning experience for them because what's great is when we're doing the director's cut, mm -hmm. I will say, I'll say, oh, by the way, this next scene, Danny cut, and now I'm gonna have him take over doing your notes, okay? And they're like, sure. And so then he steps up to the end and now he has to work on the fly and experience that. How do I make changes when the director wants them? And it's a great learning experience. Yeah. It's in a small dose, you know, at first, but it gets better and better. And then if I, and if I can, and I, I, I've been successful about this a lot of times, I've been able to get the assistant uh, a co-editing credit on at least one episode during that season. Uh, sometimes it's hard to do, you know, and it takes a while, but um, it's, it's not that hard to do for the, the union's pretty cool with it. If you pay the assistant as an editor for a week or two, you know, and it's not like they're going to become an editor and be expected to cut episodes at an mm -hmm. assistant rate, but at least it gets them a credit. And um, I think that helps them move on. That's, you know, that's one of the experiences I wish when I was on some of those bigger features, I was so busy assisting and doing all that work. And also I was syncing dailies on film and then I would do all the Avid or Lightworks assistant inputting that I missed my opportunity to actually say to my editor on some of the bigger shows, hey, do you mind if I tackle something? Do you mind if I try? You know, sure, I could have cut at 10 o'clock at night my own version of the scene because it's nonlinear and a lot of people did that. But I'll be truthful, it's like when I was working 14, 15 hour days, I was just, too dang tired to to do that so i you know I, I think i missed the boat in a couple of spots like that and we have another question uh online here from nicholas and he wants to know so 
uh, Halt and Catch Fire and Stranger Things are both set in the 80s and are very much uh, 80s nostalgic, I guess I'll say. Mm-hmm. Um, so they capture the 80s very well. Did, did you do any research or did you watch lots of 80s movies and shows to get into the mindset of that? No, I'm from the, I was in high school in the <laughs> 80s. I'm sorry, I'm old. It's just a fact. But uh, like the Duffers, I would tell them, it's like, I was in high school in 1983 and the Duffers were born in 1983. So <laughs> it was a little weird. And, uh, you know, and some things you just go, I mean, there's a lot of things like when I watched season three, I was like, yeah, okay, that's kind of, sometimes that's the movie version of what 85 was or 86, Yeah, you know, but uh, you just kind of go with it. Um, but, so when you yeah. were in the room, were you ever like, you know, like, yeah, I don't think people were wearing Ghostbusters costumes for this Halloween. I think it was the next Halloween. No, no, I, I, I didn't dare do that. No, the only thing I did, and also I, I you know, I'm one of those uh, problematic editors and that I try, I'm very anal in some ways where, especially when those shows started, like at season one, uh, there was a phone booth at the high school that Nancy makes a call on. And there was a flyer there, there that said something like this Friday, November 18th, and I was just like, I wonder if that's right. And so I typed in what, when was November 18th in 1983 or whatever the date was. And it wasn't an, a Friday. And that bugged me that I was like, you know, we should vi- visual effect this and fix this sign. But no one ever did. So it's in yeah. the show. But, uh, you know, it's like the little things like that. Yeah. But, but you almost it, have to nowadays, right? Because people online are going to be like, oh, that's a it, date. It's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the crazy things, especially with IMDb, when you see goofs and gaffes. Yeah. And so, you know, the art of editing is tricking people to see what you want them to see. Yeah. So the eye has to move across the screen and they're not supposed to notice that thing on the right because the eye is supposed to be the left. Now with pausing and, and breaking down every shot within it, it's, it's, you know, something that was like the editor, that's not a goof. We know it. They didn't shoot it right, but we're, we're trying to, we're being the magician right now. We're yeah. trying to hide that. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those. Uh, I mean, granted, in, in Stranger Things uh, season one, there was a song, uh, Sunglasses at Night. That song wasn't recorded till the next year, I believe. But th- that was one of those where the Duffers said, we don't care, it's perfect for this scene, we're gonna use it. So, yeah. you know, we weren't, we weren't uh, strict about what really fit that year. Now, I have a message for you from Wendy Woodhall, who's an awesome person. Uh, every okay. time I've chatted with her, she's been awesome. Uh, she says, thanks for being so helpful to young people getting started uh, through your union stuff. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) I try. I just, it's, I feel that my editors when especially my editor, Alan Baumgarten, he let me cut, you know, um, he let me cut when I was an assistant and I feel that's important and that's a way to learn. And now it's, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot less of that opportunity because when I was an assistant, I had to sit with my editor all day once I had dailies done. And especially once we were finished with dailies, I was his right hand and I would be behind him at the Kim or the Moviola. And he would say, uh, I need shot 36 B to give it to me. And you pull it off a hook and hand it to him as fast as you could. And then he'd, you just have to know that you, he would start to hand you back film and you would hang it and be ready to go and be winding film on a bench behind him. Uh, you know, you had to be, uh, you had to be uh, melded together that you knew what was going to happen. And that was one way to learn. And so you got to watch the editing. Uh, one editor, I didn't have, I had an editor who once did little um, grease pencil marks where to cut, like he had on a reel. He didn't even like cut the scene. He would just go through the daily reels and write one and circle it and have an in and out. And he would go through like 10 or 11 shots. And he'd have different parts of the, the audio where they have overlapping dialogue and stuff, but he knew how he wanted it cut. And you would cut it out where he said and put it together like a jigsaw puzzle, and then he would screen it. So back then it was so mechanical and so understood of what the frames were and how many, you know, you knew that um, you had uh, two seconds of of time was three feet of 35 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. And so um, he was able to like, compile it without ever cutting the film. And so you would do it. And then from then on, he would splice it. But uh, that was eye opener because I couldn't imagine that, but I got to see that. 
now the editor locks himself in a room with his avid and you know you don't you don't learn what's going on or see the tricks that they may they may have right so well it's interesting because like it, it's it's weird because like I, I i just caught that tail end of film as so as film was exiting and the avid was coming in mm-hmm. and they're like you said it's very mechanical but like I don't miss sending out, you know, if I had to draw a fade on and then sending it out and be like, well, I'll see it in a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, and people wouldn't understand if you got a black and white optical yeah. and you just cut it into this, you know, colored print, work print It was, and, and splices even, yeah. you know, um, just the whole idea of splice. There's, I wish I could teach a class on what the film room just used to be like, just call yeah. it a remember when. Um, I actually have an upright movieola that I try to bring into my cutting rooms on new shows. And so like, especially the PA who may be right out of college and never experienced even a cutting room before, I have, I have dailies from Truman Show ready to pop up there and show them, this is the sound, this is the picture, it goes on different thing. Matter of fact, I'll just tell you a quick, on, on Lawnmower Man, long, long ago, yeah. uh, our cutting rooms were next to the stages. And Pierce Brosnan was really bored one day. So he decided to come in and watch dailies on the Kim behind me. And he's sitting there in a chair and I'm talking to him and I have to change reels. And I put up the picture reel and I put up the sound reel and I, I thread them through the Kim. And we start to go and he goes, why are there two? And I was like, <laughs> I said, that's the picture and this is the sound. And he's like pauses. And then he goes, well, how do you get them to go together? And I go, well, that's what the clapper is for. I said, the sticks, when it hits, we listen for that sound and we look at the picture where the sticks are closed and that's how we sync it. He goes, that's what the clapper's for. He never knew on all the shows he had done why they were doing that, you know? And and that was just a fun experience of of having this visual that's tactile in your hands. Yeah. So that was- And I I feel like the tactile uh, experience also brought a uh, around you had to think before you cut because if you made oh I didn't like that frame and then adjust it it would get eaten in yeah. the projector and so that's you had to think it out no I mean and back in film days you watched all your dailies you made notes and you decided what you were going to how you were going to cut it before you started you wanted to know where you were going uh, mm-hmm. and and when I started in television as an editor I would do the same thing and worry about I've got to make sure I get this right but then I slowly realized oh, wait, you know, uh, you can change it quickly on nonlinear, you know? And so now, now I'm terrible if I just go, oh, I'll take two frames off. Oh, let's put a frame back. You know, it's, I would never have done that stuff when I was on, on, yeah. on films, on celluloid. But. Well, I just remember on like a light table, stringing up the film. So they were like stacked and then like taking a little magnifying, looking at each one, seeing where the arms were. See, could I make this a match cut? And Oh, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah, that that's a fun, crazy thing. So there's one last question I like to ask everyone I interview. Um, and that is, what would you say your favorite guilty pleasure film is to watch? Oh my God, I've got too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and I haven't watched it in forever, but I always love the, goof- the goofy 80s movies like Stripes and, uh, you know, Animal House, although I think that might've been 79 or whatever, mm-hmm. but I, I do like those. Um, Jeez, in the Rob Reiner films, I, you know, when Harry Met Sally, Princess Bride. I just yeah. I don't know. There's something about my youth, and when I when I originally saw those that sticks with me, and maybe it brings back those times. But uh, it's also an epic decade of films, like <laughs> from 1980 yeah. to 1990. You it know, is. It is. Yeah. That's. But, Although I change it now. I wasn't yeah. born till 83. Okay. I wasn't really in high school. I was born in 83. Yeah, oh, that's... You cut out there. Oh, am I out? Sorry. Yeah. You okay. weren't born to 83. You said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting me interview. Oh, thanks for having me. I hope, hope it was informative. So... <laughs> it was, it was amazing. All thanks right. so much. Have a, have a good one. You too. Bye.